great. Let, let's get some of the X's and O's out of the way that I know yeah. people are going to want to know. And then I, I actually want to know how much of the things that you post do you eat? Like, do you eat all of it? Do you just eat like a little bit? Like what's going on there? Um, most of the time is all of it. Um, okay. so, I mean, I share a lot of it with my girlfriend, but mm-hmm. I eat probably 75% and she might eat 25%. Um, and I mean, a lot of the stuff I post these days, they're like, I take time to like edit the pictures and I try just to post things I like. Like I, back in the day, I used to just post like, you know, oh, this hot new items out, I have to review it. So it's like, whether it's a four or a five or a 10, you're going to post about it. Mm-hmm. Now, if I'm taking the time to post about it, especially like an indie company, like a small ice cream or cookie company, I post about the ones that I like. So if I order five cookies, I might post about the one that's my favorite. And there might be a couple others in there that like, were maybe sevens or something that were like, mm. yeah, it's good. But you know, anything below a seven, you know, I mean, every rating scales are kind of, they're very subjective, but anything below a seven, I'm probably not going to like take the time to write multiple paragraphs about and edit pictures of and do all this stuff. So if I'm posting it, I ate the whole damn thing. 100%. Yeah. I, I, I like, I agree with that. Cause I, for a little bit there, I started eating just everything to try to review it. And then I was kind of at the point where I, I got to the point where I was like, I, there's a subjective few things that I like. I like cafe pana ice cream. I've yet to have a bad pint, even the ones that got like icy. Yeah. And I like making my own creations and everything else. I feel like I'm just wasting my time eating, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, it's time, it's money, it's calories, you know? And so you have to think about all those things, you know, and, and uh, I know you're into fitness and stuff and, and I am too. And I think that part of the thing is, you know, you post these fun things, but you're not posting all the chicken breasts and 99% fat free turkey and broccoli and all the all the dumb boring shit that makes up 80% of your diet. You're not posting, you know what I mean? So Mm -hmm. you have to think about like, okay, if I'm going to take this 20 25% of like these, you know, fun calories, um, it has to be worth it. You know what I mean? Like, it's got to be good stuff. And so you have to you have to pick and choose your battles there. And um, yeah, that's that's the right the right way to go is just stick with what you love you know i know you're gonna love this question ready yeah 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 how do you not get fat eating all that stuff (laughs) (laughs) um i mean i've i've had a very complicated um relationship with food i feel like i was a very heavy kid like when i was your age i was very heavy Mm -hmm. um and i have ebbed and flowed for I mean, the better part of a decade, you know, up and down and up and down. Um, the short answer is moderation and exercise. Um, I'm currently running 35 miles a week. So I do, you know, oh, wow. four, four or five miles a day um, on most days. And then like one day where I do like eight miles or something. So I kind of, I kind of fluctuate those things. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, really it's, again, it's about that, like 25%, 75%, right? So like the fun stuff that you're posting about that you're excited about, that's the smaller part of your diet. You know, um, I also don't drink much alcohol. Like most of my empty calories come from cookies and ice cream, um, and cake, you know, that's like, that's the good stuff for me. I love that. Yeah. Is there, is there a standout item that you go to? Like for me, it's ice cream. That's why I called it Emmett scoops, right? Ice cream is my go-to treat of choice is there one that you like i could have a cookie every day for the rest of my life like what's that what's your go-to it would definitely be ice cream i mean i okay. think right now i'm having a bit of a cookie phase i would say because mm-hmm. there's just so many um interesting people making crazy cookies from all across the country and i think that's something that during the pandemic that really flourished because you're like okay i'm stuck at home i can't really do too much but i can order cookies from north carolina or wisconsin or florida or whatever um and it's a lot cheaper and a lot easier than shipping ice cream and ice cream is my favorite my one true love like you know day one best dessert of all time ice cream but unless the company is taking a big hit on it, it's going to cost a lot. So even Cafe Pana, right? Like it's a pretty good deal. You know, it's free shipping or whatever. It's a hundred dollars for six pints, you know? Mm -hmm. So you're talking roughly $20 per pint. And that's an expensive hobby. (laughs) You know, it's a very expensive hobby. Um, And cookies, again, they're also not like cheap, cheap, but you can get good craft cookies for like, you know, six or seven bucks with 10 or $15 shipping. And you can try something fun and new and then 
uh, not feel like, wow, did I just make a bad decision? Am I being responsible with my money? Um, but yeah, definitely ice cream and both ordering ice cream and just like going to the scoop shop, you know, just classic getting a cone, going for a walk, you know, that, that whole vibe is just, that's the best. I love ice cream. Yeah. Ice cream. Ice cream is hard to beat. I love, I love the compactability, if that makes sense. Like if I have cookies, I want to eat every single cookie in the box, but if it's an ice cream pint, I li- it's all packed nice in there with a nice flow. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the combination of, of textures and, and flavors, you know, swirls and crunches. It's very satisfying. It's very satisfying. And yeah. that's nothing against just like a straight up good base ice cream, but we've evolved beyond that point, you know, mm-hmm. unless it's like, a, I mean, with a good base, I could have like three spoonfuls and be like, okay, like I, yeah. I experienced that, but with uh-huh. a good, like, pint like you mentioned like that's like a journey you know you're going from beginning to end depending on the density of the swirls and the size of the mixins and all this stuff can change from the top to the bottom and it's a whole it's a whirlwind it's more complex than a slice of cake or a donut or something which I also love both those things don't get me wrong but you know it's more complex than those things yeah that's that's why I started making my Emmett creations right because I I I liked I always ate at a pint. Like I'm, if I'm, I'm not going to eat anything less than a pint unless it's really freaking bad. Right, um, right. It, or if it's just a plain base, like I'm not going to eat a plain base, the whole pint. So mm-hmm. I started making these Emmett creations where the whole idea and the concept is that as you dig through this pint, it's a journey. It, the pint is an experience. You, you hit this crater of freaking cake and like, then you come across this peanut butter chasm and you're like, just as you go down, you get more engrossed in it. And that's what I'm, I'm trying to do. I mean, food is so much more than just fuel. And I hate that it's, you know, this, right. If food was just fuel, we'd all be eating 99 lean chicken breast and uh, rice, but it's not, it's, it's what is food to you? Oh, wow. Food to me is it is fuel. It is fuel. And I like to say, again, back to that kind of 75, 25, I ate a lot of the same relatively boring ish things for dinner. I'm not talking as boring as like prep food. I'm not talking about like chicken breast and steamed broccoli. I make like tacos and turkey burgers. Like I make good food, but it's like healthy. But for me, food as a whole is it's an experience. It's a connection to memories. It's a connection to people and to places, um, to cultures, to understanding people, Mm -hmm. um, connecting with just so much of like, you know, there are those foods and I mean, ice cream's a little bit of this too, but there are those foods where like, maybe they're just, they're okay, but they remind you of something from when you were eight. And so it's just like the best. Um, or, you know, you go on a vacation and you have a, a certain type of pizza or you have this one salad at this one place. And every time that you go back to that place, you have to have it because it takes you back to that moment. Um, and, and for me, I'm big into smelling. I'm a big like sniffer, if that makes sense. So like, I'm very triggered by scents. So like I'm big into burning candles and cooking is a big part of that for me too, right? Like, mm-hmm. like when you walk up to, uh, to a pizzeria or whatever and you can smell the yeast and the cheese and the garlic and like that just like, it just sends you to this special place. So for me, eating is a really, um, it, God, what's the word? It's, it's, it's magic, you know? It's a really magical, special thing that is fuel and should be treated as such. Um, but it's so much more than that. It's it's a love language, really, you know? It's a love language. What do you think about this? Since we're both in the fitness world, at least in some degree, right? We, we wouldn't yeah. be, I feel like everyone that really, maybe not everybody, but a lot of the food reviewers are also happen to be into fitness. What what do you think about this this? misconception that any form of relationship with food is a disordered way of eating a disordered way of looking at it. if it's anything but just food you're 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 ha- you have an eating disorder you see that a lot at all so it's interesting you bring up that the the connection of like you know food reviewer people and fitness and stuff and i was thinking about this i don't consider myself to be part of like the fitness industry but i consider myself to be someone that like I'm aware of my macronutrients, you know, I, I track my calories, I work out almost every day, you know, I'm a part of that culture, I guess, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, but 
it is so interesting to me because once I dove into this universe, I, I kind of find out, I found out about this sort of like food reviewer, Instagram food blog scene, like in 2016 or so. And I realized like, oh my God, there's people that write all about like Oreos and ice cream. And like, this is so interesting to me. And most of the people were ve very health conscious. You know, they were very like aware of what they were putting into their bodies. And mm -hmm. I think that comes with the love for food is an understanding that it's all about balance. And most of the people who are spending $100 on ice cream are not morbidly obese, are mm -hmm. not, um, you know, putting a lot of care and thought into what they're eating because they're just buying whatever at Walmart and eating a shit ton of it. Right. So it's not, it, it's the distorted relationship with food stems in this country, I think, from a lack of knowledge. And I think that people that love food have more knowledge about it because they want to learn about it. Like, oh, why does this taste good? Well, ice cream tastes good because it's the perfect mixture of sugar and fat, right? Like you have the two most addictive, delicious things in perfect harmony, and that's why it's good. Well, okay, so you probably shouldn't eat that for 80% of your diet, but it's okay if it's 25%. That's cool, because you know what? It's good for your brain. It makes you happy. It's fun. Mm -hmm. um, so I think going all or nothing is kind of crazy. And I, I think the idea that if you are aware of what you're putting in your body that that's disordered eating I think that's kind of crazy where I think it's the total opposite like I don't think we should be teaching chemistry in high school I think we should be teaching macronutrients and like the balance of carbohydrates and proteins and fats and how they affect your body right oh like I, I wish I knew that shit when I was you know your age when I was I mean if I had been taught these things, then I wouldn't have been super heavy graduating high school. You know, I struggled with a lot of weight stuff and, and I just didn't know. I had no idea what was going on. And the older you get, the more you learn about things, you, you inform yourself. And um, I think that's really important to stay knowledgeable, but a lot of people don't know anything. Yeah. That's why I started this whole interview thing. Cause I, I'm, I'm, I'm accepting the fact that I'm young and that I know nothing. And I, I, I know from experience diving into the fitness industry and that health world, how complicated everything that seems simple is. Everything has so many layers and it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's about trying to find out what works for you. I mean, I, I, I was really, I was really overweight in elementary school. And that's yeah. when I was like in seventh grade at the end of seventh grade, I was like, I, I need to just, I just, something has to change. And yeah. so that's when I, started diving into the fitness industry and now I'm a senior in high school and I still still have so much to learn about this one pocket of knowledge and when you say that people just don't just people just don't know and that's mm -hmm. I feel like that's so true because I liked ice cream but I wasn't a huge ice cream fan until I started diving down these like discovering things like cafe pana I'm like oh my god it's the same thing with donuts and cookies and everything. It's like, I wasn't a huge donut fan. I just like glazed donut, a buttermilk bar. Like, they're cool. They're great and all. But then I started finding these places like Colorado donuts with the freaking over the top stuffed with cookies and bits. I'm like, what is this? And I think it's just a testament to, I mean, we all don't really know anything. There's no way we could know everything. And it, yeah. you have to find joy in trying to learn, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I mean, you... You touched on a good point there. I mean, like, I think most people, and I've I've learned this too, that are like into fitness and food now, they were like, they're like fat kids growing up, you know, like, because we all have an inherent love for food, we just figured out how to balance it. Mm -hmm. And that's so true of like, all, all these people that you know, I follow, you know, whether it's Eric, you know, the family food dude, or it's uh, Chris, who runs junk banter, or I mean, any other number of these people that I've been interacting with for the last five years, like, they're all like, yeah, like I just, I loved eating like Twinkies and Pizza Hut and whatever when I was a kid. And, you know, when you're a kid, kid, when you're little, little, it doesn't matter. But then, yeah, like once you start getting into 10, 11, 12, it can start to catch up with you. And then high school, even more. And then when you carry that into adulthood, that's when it becomes uh, really challenging, I think, to learn things you're like, why don't I know this? Like, why is this affecting me this way? This is kind of crazy. And uh, figuring it out and being able to still love food. I think is like the ultimate triumph. Where do you think that line is of burning calories so you can enjoy the treats you really want to enjoy 
and then falling into a cycle of doing excessive amounts of cardio to, to eat more food. And wh- where do you think that line of disordered approach versus balance is? That's a great question. I think it's different for everyone, right? Because I think the big part of this is like metabolism and stuff. You know, mm-hmm. everybody burns calories at a different rate at a different rate, depending on their muscle mass, depending on their height, depending on, I mean, so many factors. That's why like, you know, there's those kind of like memes or stereotypes about like, oh, the girls just want to eat salads and da da da. Well, if the girl is, you know, five foot four and a hundred pounds, like if she eats the burger that, you know, her six foot 200 pound boyfriend is eating, it's going to affect her way differently. That's her whole day's worth of calories, right? Because Mm -hmm. she's not burning that much because she's little. Um, But gosh, yeah, I mean, you should never you should never do something to punish yourself. It should always just be part of a, an overall scheme. You know, like for me with like cardio, like I just, I like doing cardio. I mean, I like going for, like I always used to go to the gym and then in the pandemic when everything shut down, I kind of just like didn't go to the gym for a couple of months and I just kind of started feeling shitty. Mm-hmm. And I was like, all right, well, what am I going to do? I mean, I can go for walks, but that doesn't really get me going, going. So I started running and I started, I mean, and again, I'm not like a a fast runner. It's more of a jog, but I find that when I do that, you know, listen to a podcast, I get to really focus on my own thoughts and kind of clear my head. And so I really like it. So for me, it's not like, oh, I have to go on this run so I can eat this half a pint of ice cream tonight or else I'm a bad boy. You know, like, it's not like that. It's like, oh, like, I really like eating ice cream and I really like getting a good sweat in and clearing my head. Um, you know, like I saw you, I think it was yesterday, maybe the day before you biked like 42 miles or something, yeah, you know, 40, and like, 40, like 45 yesterday. Yeah. And that, that shit's badass. You know yeah. what I mean? Like that's fun. And, uh, and you know, then I also saw that I think it was your mom's birthday. So you guys were having like cake and ice cream. So like, right. So again, like you could look at that and be like, Oh, so, Emmett wanted to have cake and ice cream. So he biked 45 miles. He's a psychopath. Like that's wrong. You should just be able to enjoy yourself. But at the same time, it's like, no, I just did two cool things. You know, like it's, it's okay. It's, it's okay to like, yeah, bike 45 miles and also to have like a pint of ice cream and a slice of cake. Like that's okay. Now, if that's every single day, that might be kind of weird, but like there are people who make a a whole living off that. Like, I don't know if you know, Eric, the electric, one of my favorite, I was going to bring him up. He's one of my favorite guys to follow. And, and I know he catches a lot of flack, but I love following him too, because I find it motivational on two fronts. Yeah. Like, well, first of, first of all, I'm never going to sit down and eat 15,000 calories, but you know what? I'm also not going to go do a, a 50 mile bike ride every single fucking morning. So yeah. like he's, he's on another level of mm-hmm. extreme, but I find both sides of that. So inspirational. I'm like, damn dude, I could never eat like that. So props to him. But also like everybody thinks about like, what would it be like to sit down and eat a hundred Krispy Kreme donuts? Like that sounds fun. I don't think I could do it, Mm -hmm. but that sounds fun. And also, you know, being able to do some of the crazy cardiovascular stuff he does, like that sounds really cool too. I don't know that I'm ever going to be able to be like that, but I, I don't, I just find that stuff so interesting, you know? So yeah, you can look at it as disordered or you can look at it as it's just, and I mean, in Eric's case, it's two extremes, right? It's a life of two extremes. And um, I don't know, I just find it so much more interesting when we're aware about what we're putting into our bodies and about Mm -hmm. uh, cherishing those moments too, because you should never be afraid of food. You know, it's like the term cheat meal, I think is like pretty toxic. And the the term that, you know, like, oh yeah, well, I'm cheating today. So it's just, no, you're not cheating. You're just, I, I, and again, when I started, you know, like 10 years ago, and I kind of started getting my life in order and losing weight and stuff, I did think in that mentality of cheat meal and this and that, and whatever. And that did lead to some really disordered, weird relationships with food um, that eventually, I mean, I was, I mean, this is not about, this podcast is about food reviewing and music. So we won't go too crazy, but like, hey, man, it's lots, about learning about you. I think lots, everyone can be inspired by anything. Lots of restrictive eating, I found eventually led to binging, right? Which is not something that I'd ever really had uh, experience with. But once I had restricted and restricted and restricted, and I'm talking about eating 1200 calories a day and doing an hour of cardio. Like I'm talking about like, I was like, and again, this is before I knew what the fuck I was doing. I was just like, I need to lose weight. And I like, I went crazy and it worked, but I was losing muscle mass. 
I was fatigued all the time. And then it eventually led to me binging. I mean, like I would like wake up in the middle of the night, basically like starving and I would just start eating stuff. Mm-hmm. And, and it's, it's just, it's a weird, it's a weird thing that, you know, had never happened to me before and doesn't happen to me anymore. But when you go too far into the realm of restrictions and, oh, this is a cheat and, oh, this food is bad and da, 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 it really fucks up your head. So I think having a healthy relationship of knowing I like exercising and I also like eating, it's okay to do both of those things. And it's okay to eat the things that taste good because when you tell yourself you're only going to eat you know, clean foods or whatever all the time and in low quantities and, you know, try and restrict yourself. You destroy your metabolism, you destroy your mental health. And it's just not a, it's not a good place to be. So um, I don't even remember what the question was, but yeah. <laughs> I, I, I find Eric really inspirational to a guy like myself because he really kind of showed me that I think that line between disordered eating and balanced eating is all in the mind. Like Mm -hmm. a binge where you wake up in the middle of the night and have no control, eat your face off and then feel guilty for the next four days. That's a problem. But at the same time, if you eat an excessive amount of calories after burning a ton of calories and you just, you kind of get into that sugar space and you just eat, way too much than you think, but you don't feel guilty about it and you enjoyed yourself and have fun. I don't think that's too much of a problem if you're not doing that every day. That's, that's my, my opinion. Like I love the feeling of not eating much during the day when I go on those long cycles and then having a lot at nighttime. I, but I don't feel guilty about it. I don't beat myself up about it because look at a guy like Eric, that guy does the same thing, but he, he doesn't, it's not about being guilty about it. It's about finding the balance that works for you. I have a crazy, I was meant to be a fat kid. Like that's why I was a fat kid. Like I could put down 6,000 calories a day easily. Like mm-hmm. a 10,000 calorie challenge for me is like a Saturday. Like I could do that. I, I have a crazy appetite and I had to figure out a way to be like, look, I want some days I want to eat a shit ton of food. Now, how yeah. do I do that? Do I want to go force myself to walk on the treadmill and stay on master? No, that's miserable. And I hate my life when I do that. But I found I love to ride my bike. And I found riding my bike far, I burn a shit ton of calories. So I was like, why don't I just eat the ton of food and let myself kind of be free and just enjoy myself on the night when I burn a ton of calories? That works for me. And to other people, it's, oh, you just binge. Well, yeah, to you, that would be a binge. But to me... That's just me eating to freaking satiety into how I enjoy myself. It's, it's all different yeah. for everybody. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I agree. And that's uh, the thing that worked for me is I found, I started doing a couple of years ago, intermittent fasting. And that's something mm-hmm. that I really love. Um, and because I do, again, kind of like you, it's hard for me to eat to the point of feeling full. Like yeah. it, it's like, like being like full, 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 you know, like, I go out to eat with my mom and she has like half of her, whatever she got. She's like, oh, I'm so full. And I'm like, seriously? Like, how do, Dude, how do you I'm this, I literally could eat to the point yeah. of feeling like I'm going to be sick. And then once I feel like I'm going to be sick, I'm just sad that I can't eat anymore. Like, yeah, I don't no. know what, maybe it's hormones. I don't know what it is. I just yeah. can't get enough. I mean, you're, you're a grown boy. You're lifting a lot. It, it, <laughs> it makes sense. I mean, but, but I found with intermittent fasting, which I started doing um, about two years ago, uh, almost three years ago. Um, is that if I don't eat too early, I don't really get hungry. And it's, um, it's like, you know, you can have your coffee, you can have your, you know, zero calorie energy drinks or whatever, you know, caffeine, da, da, da. But like, like, I found that when I was eating small meals throughout the day, um, it just got me hungrier all the time like it like kick kick started my system and I was just like I was hungry and then I was hungry and then I was hungry and then I was hungry and so I found some people online I, I found King Schratz and I found Blake and I found some other people they were doing intermittent fasting on Instagram and I was like wow they just eat one meal a day this is so interesting to me and I don't think I could ever do that like that's crazy I have to like go to work I have to like interact with people I'm gonna feel like I'm gonna die all day and I just decided to try it and it's a little bit weird at first 
Um, and I went from doing kind of like a, a two meals a day to now I mostly do, it's kind of like a, I wouldn't say it's a full on one meal a day, but I do kind of like eat between six and 10 ish. And then that's kind of it. So I kind of like, you know, my window or whatever is four hours. Um, and I don't really tend to eat during the day. And, uh, I just don't really get hungry. And then I eat to the point where I'm like full and then I go to bed and I sleep hella good. And then I wake up and I'm not hungry, you know? So, but again, it's, it's very different because when I was restricting a lot, which, you know, led me eventually to, you know, feeling bingy and stuff, I, I was not really allowing myself to eat like tasty things most days. Whereas like now I have some kind of tasty thing every day. So it's like, I'll have like half of one of those big cookies or like a serving of ice cream or some combination of the two or whatever, like pretty much every day, some kind of like good, fun, tasty dessert. But mm -hmm. then the rest of the food is really nutrient dense and just kind of tasty, but um, healthy, if you will. And before what I was doing was I was like, oh, I can only have like cookies and ice cream and donuts on this like one day a week. So it's like I had a cheat day where it was like, <laughs> it was just like all hell would break loose, like as much alcohol, I'd wake up instantly donuts and Oreos and whatever. And like, I'm not going to the gym today and I'm drinking booze. And it was just like crazy. It was like absolute insanity. And now I just have a much more balanced approach where I do have a higher calorie day, like on Saturdays, I tend to have like, that's my day where I'll eat out or something. Mm -hmm. And I say higher calorie because it's not a cheat day. It's just like, oh, I'm going to like eat out tonight. And you know mm -hmm. what? They put a lot of fat and like butter and it's good a treat day. Food. It's a treat day. Yeah. Not a cheat day, a treat day. And then I usually have my like highest output, you know, my going for a PR or whatever type of exercise day on that Sunday. So I'm like all fueled up and then I'm like ready to go. And then I'm like, oh yeah, I can run faster. I can run longer. I can lift more. I can whatever. So it was all about thinking about food as like fun and, and social and like exciting, but also as fuel. You're like, I'm going to eat all this food. I'm going to enjoy the shit out of it. And I'm going to run farther than I've ever run in my life, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like, that's something that I was missing before. And I think that I learned a little bit of that from guys like Eric, you know, who I'm like, oh yeah, you can kind of do both. And it's like, not problematic. Mm -hmm. It's just like two sides of the coin, you know, it's fun. And I legitimately love the days when I eat until I feel like my head is going to explode. And it's just so fun. And then I also love the days where I'm just like, oh yeah, I'm not really very hungry today because I ate so much last night. And I'm like really using that fuel. You know, to me, that's very healthy. And I think for some people, they would see that as being weird and disordered. But to me, that relationship is actually pretty healthy. Understanding food is fuel, but also understanding that food is an art form. So yeah. Yeah. I I connect with that a lot and I have a good question to ask off of that. But yeah. I, I, I like to do it like backwards from how you do it. I, I like to do the, do the cardio or do that big exercise and then have that thing after. I don't mm -hmm. know. I just, that's just how I like to do it because I feel like I could just, and people see it as a binge because all those calories, 90% of the calories are in that after the time period. But I mean, I'm anyway, that's, that's, that's a whole nother uh, people's totally. opinions, totally. but I, I found that works for me. I have breakfast and then a pretty decent breakfast, like between five to 700 calories. And then I don't really eat much during the day. And then I eat most of my calories at night. Mm -hmm. I like to be hungry. I like the feeling of hunger as an actor. I love to be hungry when I'm acting. I think better. I'm sharper. I don't know why I just am same thing with the podcast. I'm sharper. And like, I haven't eaten since, uh, eight, eight 30 in the morning. And what is it? It's like almost two. Mm -hmm. So do you find that staying hungry during the day has helped with your music at all? Um, I think that I'm kind of most creative in the morning naturally. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the one thing that I did find when I started doing intermittent fasting was like, again, once you get used to it, you do get kind of this like mental clarity. And I think a little bit of it is like, I mean, I love coffee and the caffeine hits a little harder when you don't <laughs> yeah, have food, you know, and I'm like, I'm like, let's go baby. But, but I did find myself getting like a mental clarity because I'm not bogged down by digestion and like working through the calories my body's trying to process and whatever may happen. I'm just kind of able to focus more. I'm able to lock in more. Um, 
fasted cardio has not been a problem. Um, you know, going and walking long distance or going to events or having, you know, full days, it's not a problem for me whatsoever. And I find myself able to really lock in because I'm not thinking about food. So that's the cool thing is that with intermittent fasting, I was like, okay, I don't eat breakfast. I don't eat lunch. Um, I'm not even going to think about it. So I don't have to prep my food. I don't have to clean my food. I don't have to like stop every three hours and be like, I'm so hungry. I need to, you know, I'm just able to boom, lock in. So whether that's, you know, whether it's exercise or it's writing or it's music, um, I'm really able to just focus on what I want to focus on during the day. And then at night, when I start eating and stuff, I'm not usually working on music and stuff anymore. So it's like a, it's like a mental switch, you know, it's like, okay, now I'm gonna, gonna make dinner, gonna turn on the Netflix, gonna, you know, chill out. And it's just like a total separate thing. So like, when I am working, I am hungry, both yeah. literally and figuratively, like you mentioned being an actor, right? So uh -huh. I'm hungry in the sense that I'm not full, I'm not bogged down. And then when it is time to eat, to me, that's kind of time to chill. So around six o'clock, I'll have my, you know, my snack and, you know, usually like, you know, decent proteins and veggies or whatever. And I kind of like ease into it while I'm before I cook. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I'm usually taking my work hat off and it is kind of nice. Cause I'm just, I just focus in, it's just water, coffee, you know, maybe some sugar-free energy drink stuff, um, working on music, writing, whatever the case may be. Um, and when the nighttime comes, it's time to chill. Yeah. And I like that. And it also to that point, whether you're, you know, just, you know, whether you're counting your calories or whether you're doing intermittent fasting, whatever the case may be, it allows you to really appreciate and just like love the food that much more. Cause yeah. if you're like, I'm going to make one meal today, I'm going to make it count. So I'm going to make sure my avocado is fresh. I'm going to make sure my meat is hella well seasoned. I'm going to make sure that I have the right drink. I'm going to make sure that, you know, whatever. And then when you cap it off with, you know, uh, a really good ice cream from Cafe Pana or a really good cookie or whatever the case may be, you're like, I'm living good. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm yeah. experiencing really good tastes, sensations, and you really appreciate it. And I think that so often the problem with eating in this country is we do a lot of distracted eating. We do a lot of unintentional eating. And like you said, not eating during the day, more or less, you know, that's when you're getting shit done. And so you wake up, you have a good, powerful breakfast. And trust me, I mean, when I was your age, I, I don't, you know, I wouldn't say someone who's a senior in high school should be doing intermittent fasting. Like you're growing, you got to get out there, have a good breakfast. That sounds fucking great. You're probably eating a way better breakfast than I did, which is, you know, like caramel macchiatos and croissants from Starbucks and stuff. But, you know, getting a good balanced breakfast, I think is an awesome way to focus, to tap in. And especially if you're then being satisfied and full, move on, kill the rest of your day and then enjoy your, your dinner. You know, yeah. and I think that that's the problem is that we so often eat in ways where we're not enjoying and we're not aware of like, oh, I'm just going to snack on some nuts. Well, dude, you just put back 500 calories worth of nuts sitting at your desk or, oh you know, in your car or whatever, and not even like tasting it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that, that was the thing that I had to really learn how to cut out was like, okay. I mean, obviously everyone knows liquid calories are sketch, like, you know, soda and, you know, all that's just no bueno. But um, switch it for diet soda. Yeah, period. switch it for switch it for diet soda, which I mean, I haven't had regular soda and I, I don't even know how many years. Right. And um, you know, it's it's easy. There's great diet sodas. I mean, the <clears throat> Coke Zero and all that stuff's fantastic as far as the flavor is concerned. Um, same thing with energy drinks, the zeros and you know, the rains and the bangs and all that stuff. I mean, if you're trying to get calf, there's plenty of good things for for no sugar. So um but anyway, it's the, it's the distracted eating, right? And I think that's the biggest problem. So I do oftentimes eat dinner, like watching like a show or I'm a big basketball fan, watching basketball or, or watching something, but it's not just like, oh, I'm grabbing a bunch of stuff and I'm just like snacking endlessly. I'm like, no, I'm like appreciating what I'm watching. And I'm also appreciating what I'm eating because I just cooked it and I'm aware of what's going into it. I know the macronutrients. I know what's going on here. Um, so I think that, connecting with your food is a major, major plus to, um, again, either what's two meals a day or one meal a day, or, or just being aware of the days when you're going to eat a lot or eat less. Like, I think that having that in your back pocket just makes it so much more enjoyable. Totally. I mean, I, yeah. I have, I plan m like breakfast and lunch is always 
I always feel best when it's structured. I don't like to like, if I have a bit de- pretty big lunch and then I have some snacks, I, I just feel like shit. Uh, I've, I'm just, I'm discovering this. It's trial and error for everybody out there. Like some people love the seven meals a day bodybuilder structure. And if you're trying to yeah. put on as much muscle as you can, you're probably going to need that. But yeah, absolutely. I, I, that's why I decided I don't want to be an IFBB pro. I like to lift weights, but I also like to do a fuck ton of cardio and I like to eat shit food sometimes. And I don't yeah. like to eat during the day because it makes me bogged down, but like I'll have a protein bar or something if I'm starving during the day or maybe two, but it's all planned. It's not like I'm just willy nilly. Like, ah, oh, I'm going to have some of this, some of that, because I don't like the way a ton of food in the day makes me feel I'm the same way as you, man. Mm-hmm. I, the, especially during summer, like during school, it's a little, little different, but when I have time to myself, I mean, morning I eat and then I work out pretty close to that. So I'm fueled. Right. Mm-hmm. And then the rest of my day is either planning podcasts, working on scripts, um, doing interviews on here and not just planning it, editing the things, Instagram, stuff like that. And then I yeah. work in the nighttime. So anywhere from one to 10 or f- four to 10. Right. Yeah. And then after all that, I find I can focus so much more and I can be so much more passionate about the things that I'm focusing on and everything else. That's where the hangriness comes from. Everything else right. is like, dude, you and your shitty freaking conversation about nothing I don't care about. But this customer that I'm trying to serve, I'm going to give my all to it. And I'm sharper and I'm more attentive. And then when I get home at night, it's when I pop in the YouTube, cook my dinner up, really focus on cooking, start to relax, put on the Netflix, like you said. And it's yep. like a whole yep. mind shift. I'm shutting down for the night. And I mean, I'm a bit of a, I find I'm a bit of a loner. Because of that, like, I, I just don't no put doubt. up with other people's bullshit. I just don't, yeah. I don't care about, and that's kind of hard in high school when everyone, not everybody, but everyone's got their own bullshit because everyone's just trying to fit in. And I've mm-hmm. kind of like faded away from that and like, look at the bigger picture. And I'm like, I just, I don't really care if I don't have close friends right now. I don't have close friends right now. And I've noticed with your music. Yeah. I've listened to a couple things. It's not like anything I've ever heard. Yeah. Like it's just, it's, 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 it's own thing. And I'm like, this yeah. is freaking art because it's just an expression of a different person. Do you find yourself falling down the rabbit hole of being uh, different or a loner or on the outside or something like that? And do you express it through your music? What's up with that? Yeah. So, I mean, I guess I'll give you a little history. It's, it's funny. Cause you, you brought up like, you know, being a senior in high school and kind of not fitting in whatever. So, I, <laughs> I've been making. I, for- I, I, I want to take it back. It's not like I. I don't want you to think I sit by myself and eat lunch. Like I'm surface level close with a lot of people. People know my name, but I yeah. just I don't dive down that deep friendship rabbit hole with a lot of people. No, and I mean, I totally get where you're coming from, and I. You have figured your shit out, like as far as like you know, you're you're like the way I'm gonna eat, the way I'm gonna conduct myself, and even just trying to start, you know this podcast and and talking to people and learning things like you are you're mature beyond your years I feel like you at you know 17 is where I was at probably when I was like 21 22 or something so it's interesting when I was a senior in high school I was the opposite I was the social butterfly I was I had to be at parties I had to be involved I was eating like a psychopath drinking like a psychopath I mean it was like my senior year I almost didn't get out of high school I mean it was like I went crazy um but at the same time i also started my first band in in high school um and and that was when i really kind of realized that okay i want to play music like i very seriously want to play music and so i'm a lot older than you i'm 33 so i graduated high school in 2006 so i started my first band in 2006 and uh, 2005, 2006, I was just Mr. Party. I was just like, it's time to go. Like, you know, whatever, whatever was out there, we did it and we enjoyed it. And it was a blast. Like that was the way that I viewed my high school experience, at least on the exit. And once I was done with that, I was like, man, like music is actually kind of what I want to do. And the more that I delved into music and took it seriously, as the years went on, I got farther and farther away from people who were not also pursuing something else. So like 
no shade, but like, you know, in 2007, 2008, I still had friends from 2006 who were just doing the same shit. They were just popping pills and raving and doing crazy shit all the time. And I was like writing songs and playing shows and trying to get on tour and like do this stuff. And I just kind of gradually started cutting people out, not intentionally, but I was just like, dude, like I can't go to parties anymore because I have to play shows. I don't have time to sit around and smoke weed and talk about movies for three hours because I have to go to the studio, you know? So I just made this decision to like really dive into it. And uh, then I, I just, I pretty much never stopped. Like I, I started in 06 and went very steady until 2016. The, the main project that I had was called Rin Tin Tiger as in a band with my brother from 2011 to 2016. Mm-hmm. And um, in 2016, and we were in San Francisco and in 2016 um, he decided to, he, he wanted to go solo. He wanted to move to Los Angeles. Like he just like, wasn't feeling SF anymore. And there's a lot of stuff going on. And the drummer and I were both like, well, we're kind of, I don't know, we're down with SF. And so it was never like a a harsh breakup, but it was just kind of like the band after almost six years just kind of stopped. Mm -hmm. And um, that is when, right around that same time, the end of 2016 actually is when I discovered um, Junk Banter and the Impulsive Buy and like all of these like food blog websites and Instagram and stuff. And um, that's when I started my own blog was in October of 2016. And I was still in the band at the time, but it was, there was like this shift going on, you know, whereas like I had been playing in bands for 10 years, put out, you know, six different records, you know, with various projects and like, it had been an up and down crazy thing. And uh, the end of 2016, I started my own blog and then the impulsive buy had open auditions for new staff writers. And I got that gig. And then there was kind of like this thing happening where it was, you know, okay, beginning of 2017, my brother moves to LA. And then suddenly it's like, okay, well, I guess I have a blog now. And I also have um, this, you know, part-time gig writing for the impulsive buy. And uh, I guess I'm just going to dive into this. So I went from doing music like full steam ahead for 10 years. I also went to college, um, but I I got a degree in creative writing from San Mm. Francisco state. And so I was like, okay, I pretty much graduated college and said, fuck you school. I want to make music and went and played rock and roll for, you know, six years. And then all of a sudden here I am now without a band and my brother who I was very close to, I'm I'm still very close with, there's no bad blood at all, is in LA. What am I going to do? Well, I started writing like about like Oreos and stuff. I guess I'll just do that more. And so then I just went full steam ahead into writing. Um, for all of 2017 and most of 2018. And then I had a really bad breakup. I was in a relationship for five years and I pretty much had stopped playing music for like a year and a half. Like I honestly, I was burnt out. Like I didn't even want to go to concerts, like for doing it for 10 years and having various levels of success, um, you know, obviously never like massive success, but like, you know, playing good shows, going on the road, you know, making some, you know, it was- Was it your full-time job at the time? It was not my full-time job. It okay. was, it was always a, it was always a, uh, I worked in coffee the whole time. I worked doing coffee stuff the whole time. So it was like, I had a very flexible job that I could take a couple of weeks off and go on tour, take a couple of weeks off and go to the studio, go back and forth. So, I mean, living in the most expensive city in the country, unfortunately, it could never be a full-time job, yeah. but it got to the point where it was decent. You know, it was like, it, it was completely self-sustainable and, you know, we're, we're able to, you know, buy a van and press vinyl and do all this stuff just from the the money that the band has been generating. So like it it did pretty good. But anyway, in 2018, after doing like the food blogging thing, kind of like seriously, I I did some freelance work for uh, a local publication called SF Weekly. And I went on this local show called Check Please Bay Area, where I like did a segment on food reviewing stuff. I did a, I dove super intensely into this and then had a massive breakup I was in a relationship for five and a half years and had this big breakup in 2018. And suddenly I was like, who gives a fuck about ice cream? Who gives a fuck about Oreos? You know, it was just all of a sudden my life was like, I need to make songs again. And literally like three days after that breakup in 2018, I started making music again. And it was like something had been reawoken within me. And I pretty much haven't stopped since then. And from the middle of 2018, I guess from like September, October of 2018, I kind of didn't do much 
food writing for, I don't know, six months or something. And I just kind of really started doing music and it, it took, took a long time. And when you get massively heartbroken, it's like pretty hard to, it felt like my world had ended basically. Like I, 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 I was pretty depressed. Um, but that was when I realized that my true love, my serious true love is music and making music is the most satisfying, most beautiful, soul fulfilling thing that I can possibly do with my time. And I've reached this interesting point now in 2021 where like, I'm able to kind of do both. Like I put out a project in 2019. I put out a project in 2020. I'm putting out one th this fall that I've been working on. And I told myself in 2018, I said, you know, you suddenly lost your band at the beginning of 2017 that you thought was going to be like the one, you know, and then you just started this food thing. And then you ended up breaking up with a girl who you thought was the one. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to go back to my first, the one. And I said, I'm going to put out a project for, you know, one project per year, whether it be an album, an EP, whatever for the next five years. And I'm just going to see what happens. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I rebranded myself sort of as like a solo um, musician. Um, and this is a very long-winded way to answer your question. No, <laughs> no, I'm dude, I'm fascinated right yeah, now. Yeah, <laughs> it's a very long-winded way to answer your question that yes, I do find myself kind of being on the outside because I love, I mean, I was listening to a lot of, a lot of hip hop, a lot of, you know, I mean, a lot of pop rap, a lot of, um, you know, trap, and also a lot of metal and and I was playing in like an alternative folk rock band. And so my musical influences are kind of um, insane. And so I've been really trying to figure out my sound like the project is cesspool that I put out in 2019. It's a breakup album and it's basically like auto tune rap with like some kind of Pink Floydy influences. And then the project I put out last year is more, I started incorporating heavier guitars and different types of drums. And there's some rapping, but it's mostly singing. And now I've, I've kind of realized that like, I'm more, I'm more down with the singing side for myself than the rapping side. Um, there are very few white dudes that can rap and it's convincing and awesome, you know? And um, I like to sing. So I've been, it's really been a, a trial and error of like, refinding myself and finding my sound after being in a, in bands for 10 years, basically. Um, some of the times I was a songwriter for the bulk of it, I wasn't, I was just, you know, writing my bass parts and singing backup harmonies and stuff. And so figuring out what, what I want to do as someone who doesn't have to work with anyone else. And it's my first time trying to pursue being a solo artist and mm -hmm it is unlike anything else. You know, it's like, I've found that my songs are too rock for like people that are into like rap and they're too pop for people that are into metal, but they're too heavy and weird for people that are into pop. You know, it's like, it's like, it's, it floats in this space where it's like, yeah, well, I like heavy music and I like pop and I like like trap production. And so I'm trying to like fuse all these things together and also just like as a solo artist, just trying to, to make something that is true to myself that I can, that I can do myself because as we talked about earlier, you know, being sustainable, like making music and getting paid for, it's pretty hard. I mean, it, you have a, a very, very, very small chance of making it. Um, and you know, to his credit, my brother, when he, when he left and moved to LA, like he's done it. He's a full-time musician. He got a record deal and he pays his bills with Spotify checks. And, you know, like he, he went and did it, but he also took a year and a half of being homeless, sleeping on people's couches and like made a bunch of sacrifices that at the time I was not willing to make. Mm -hmm. Right. So I do have people in my life who are doing sort of, I guess, what, what I'd like to be doing. Um, they are, successful with music but i have so many more people in my life myself included who are still just you know doing it out of pure passion and just trying to get it off the ground like it's it's hard it's a grind out here man it's a grind are you scared at all that your passion and your love for it will diminish if you put in that all in everything's on the table 
every single day for the next 50 years or however long it takes to do that? Are you scared that it'll become more of a job than still passion for you? Yeah. I mean, I think I try to prevent that now, honestly, just in terms of like, like I'm trying to be as productive as possible, even though, you know, music, music and food reviewing, neither of those are paying the bills. There's a little bit of money coming into it, but they're mostly just like highly glorified hobbies basically, Mm -hmm. you know, but I feel like having both of those things in my life keeps each of them from getting stale. If that makes sense. Like I'll go like, Mm -hmm. like I've been working on these, these songs I've been like doing vocals and stuff every day. And like, I haven't been posting a lot on my cesspool Instagram account. Cause I've been working a lot. I've just been like working on a lot of new music and there hasn't been a lot of stuff to post because like, it's so much easier to create content. If you're doing a review of something or you're, you know, interviewing or doing some kind of thing that involves another product or another person, then when you're trying to like, put out an original song or original, you know, video or idea or whatever. So it's like, for me, the food review stuff, whether it's picture editing or writing for the impulsive buy or whatever it may be, it allows me to keep my creative brain engaged without getting too like emotional with it. Whereas like the music stuff for me is like super emotional. Like I'm writing lyrics. I'm like, you know, you know, most of my music is it's, I don't really write happy songs. It's like kind of dark and like kind of sad. And that's not to say I'm a dark and sad person all the time, but like, that's where I get my creative mojo from. Whereas like figuring out different adjectives for like, you know, crazy ice creams and cookies and stuff that is fun and flexes your brain, but it's not like emotional. You're not sitting there like crying, you know? So for me, Having both of these things, like I can go three days where I'm just like working on music and I'm like, I am so fucking burnt out right now. I'm going to edit some pictures of ice cream, you know, and then I'm able to, instead of just like fully shutting down and like, I'm going to watch Buffy the Vampire Slayer for the third time. Like, I'm going to do something that allows my brain to be engaged, but it's also not like taxing. Like, I guess what I'll say is like making music, like I said earlier, is the most rewarding and satisfying thing that I have in my life, but is also the most stressful 100% because you feel it's so weird because you're taking these thoughts and these sounds and presenting them to other people, but they are then validated by whether or not someone else likes them. And of course you want people to like it, But at the same time, if you're like, oh, well, only 50 people stream my song, I guess I fucking suck. You know, that's a really bad thing. Whereas like, if I post a picture and only 10 people like it of some cookie, I don't give a fuck. Like that was just like fun. You know, it's like, okay, I wish, I wish more people liked this cookie picture, but whatever. Whereas like, if a song doesn't resonate with somebody, it feels like a death of a child because you spent months piecing together this three minute thing. And it is so like finding the will to continue. And I think this is true for an artist, whether you're, you know, making your very first EP or whether you are the Foo Fighters trying to put out a follow-up project to your last hit record, the fear and the, just the idea that like people aren't going to connect with what you're trying to do is so um, debilitating at times, but it's also so fulfilling when even just, one person is like, oh my God, I love that. Or, oh, I, you know, I had to send this to my best friend because, you know, I knew they would love the way that you're fusing these genres together or whatever the case may be. So it's like, it's so stressful making music and it's not stressful writing about food. It's just fun. Man, everything you just said hit so hard. And I just made like a couple realizations about myself that's because it's the same thing for me man when i post a fitness thing or like a workout yeah i busted my ass in the gym yeah i took a lot of time and took put a lot of heart into making the edit flow properly and the right music and the timing and everything but if that video gets 10 likes i don't give a fuck but i don't know if you've seen i also make like a rap rap type poetry and I, I did couple, see that. I have a couple on there and it's 
it takes so much because I lean more towards the poetic side because I don't know if I could ever rap over a beat, but I love the way each to match each and every syllable with another rhyme and then the complicated rhyme schemes and then like doing flips with words that I know 90% of people aren't going to get, but I get, and then putting me as an actor, my emotion into it. And I do the same thing when I post monologues, sometimes I post a monologue and it's stuff that I put a lot of fucking effort into. And when I post something like that and it gets 10 likes, I'm like, well, shit, that's when I start questioning, am I even ever any good at this? Am I ever, yeah. like, I put heart and soul into this. And it's 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 easy to, for me to fall into that trap of just posting uh, physique shots or posting freaking lifting things. But that's not what I'm passionate about. That's why I, I, that's one of the reasons I keep that poetry rap on the, as a hobby. Like, I don't want to be a rapper. I want to be an actor. And I'm, I'm comfortable with facing the rejection with that time after time again. I'm willing to do that. With the poetry rap thing, I'm like, it's a ho- it's a way for me to vent and it's a way for me to take an emotion I'm feeling in a moment and create something out of it instead of just whining and complaining about it. And I love to do it. I'm proud of it. But you're so right when that doesn't, when a piece of your heart doesn't get the validation or attention you think it deserves, it hurts. And yeah. w- w- wow. Why do you think that we care so much about what others think in one regard, but in another regard, when we're creating it, we don't really. Well, I, I think that there's, there's a couple of things at play here. I think the first thing is, well, first thing I want to comment on is that I did see the last video you posted of that. And it was actually really impressive. I wasn't sure if you were just like reciting something. No, no, I wasn't I sure if you were like paying homage to like Lil Wayne or something, you know, like no, it, no, no. It, was, it did have like a slam poetry kind of vibe to it. Um, but yeah, that was fire. I mean, your, your brain is, is doing so many cool things. I've got one that you should check out. It's called the system. It's all about school. It was after we took the state test and I was so freaking pissed about the way school was structured that I made. I have a couple on there, but they're hidden in the IGTV area because like I took them off my page because I wanted to like rebrand, but I think you might, I think you might get a kick out. I'll check it out. Um, but yeah, why do we care? I mean, that's such a good question. Like, I think the thing is, is that it's not, you have to create for yourself, right? First and foremost. And I've had many conversations. And I mean, I realized this, like when I was decided, okay, I'm going to make music again, and I'm going to release a project every year for five years, starting in 2019, I realized that starting at the beginning of doing something, you know, and whether that's making music or, or even like making this podcast, whatever it is, you have to do this thing for a long time, purely off of passion to get people to take you seriously. Because the reality of it is whether you're a food Instagram or a podcast or musician, most people don't last longer than two years. And the reason being, so I saw, I looked at this and I said, okay, if I'm putting out my first project in 2019, people aren't even going to really be like considering to take me seriously until 2020, 2021. And then of course the pandemic happens. So I actually played my first solo show in January of 2020. I've like worked up to it. And I like did this whole thing where I, I planned a set. I played my whole first album, you know, front to back live. And I had this light show and all this stuff and the pandemic happened. So no fucking shows. Right. So I was like, God damn it. Like I worked up to this and I had the connections and I did good and fuck because I lived 10 years on the fucking stage. And then I stopped playing because I didn't have a band and I finally work up to it and whatever. So now I kind of feel like, well, how do I play this new stuff live? I don't know. But anyway, you have to do something purely out of passion to prove to people that you're worthy of their time and their money and their attention. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's because making a podcast is kind of fun. Making a song is kind of fun, but finishing it, booking the guests, editing it, having your album mastered, you know, paying for promo, getting album artwork, doing, it takes so much fucking energy that you have to be willing to put yourself through basically being ignored and laughed at for literally at least two years before anyone gives a shit. Um, And that's just something that I've learned. It's like a lot of people feel like, oh, I want to make music. And then they put out one five track EP and they're like, why isn't everybody loving this? Like, well, because you have to do it three more times before anyone takes you seriously, because that first project is purely passion and, and purely fun. And that second one is a little mix of, of both. And that third one is honestly, 
if you're not at a point where you're like paying your bills, you're like working a full-time job and doing whatever it is on the side and compromising relationships and compromising money and just putting your, you know, you're basically being crazy Yeah. to be someone to start up a band or a podcast or a, a YouTube series or whatever. In the beginning, you have to be absolutely crazy. Yeah. And, um, the one thing that I found is when music was out of my life for a year and a half, um, I missed it. I missed it um, a lot. And it, it makes me so much more satisfied to have music. And honestly, it, it makes me really happy to write about food and stuff too. Like it, 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 I wouldn't do that if it didn't make me happy um, because I love food and having something really delicious and then sharing it with other people is way more fun, you know? And this just goes all the way back to like, I started before I was doing the blog, I was doing Yelp reviews all the time. Like I would write all the time. So I was like, I was Yelp elite for two years. So I like wrote enough reviews that I got the elite badge and I was like going to Yelp events and tasting things with other people and like doing all this stuff. So like, that is fun for me, but music is like, nothing feels worse than when music isn't going well and nothing feels better than when it is like when I have a good day of crafting something and I like listen back put the headphones on I'm like oh my god this song is fucking sick like there's no high better than that but when it's not going good if I put something out and no one likes it or I just have a day where I'm recording and writing and everything sounds like shit it's like legit depressing so um you know, we, we talked earlier about unhealthy relationships with food. Maybe I have unhealthy relationships with music, but I'm, I'm not going to stop it. You know, I mean, I think that's that's part of the passion, right? Is like, it, it blows my mind. And this, I bring this up as something that you have talked about a lot. There are people out there that just don't give a shit, right? And like that shit drives, I'm like, sometimes I envy them. Sometimes yeah. I'm like, oh, totally. I wish I could just not give a shit because I wake up and like, you know, I, I'm a Capricorn, so I, I like schedules and my girlfriend always makes fun of me because I'm always, she's like, you should just chill out. I'm like, no, but I have, I have to do my run. I have to do my song thing. I have to do this. I have to edit this thing. I got to get this, I got to go to the store to look for this new thing so I can write about, it. you know, like I have all these things I have to do. And I don't think it's like full on insanity, but I care. <laughs> I feel like if I waste a day, I feel like unaccomplished. That's to me, that's, that's what passion is. And that's what yeah. life is about, finding that thing. Uh, and this is this is not me speaking from my soapbox. This is me speaking from – this is just what I've discovered from interviewing all sorts of different people. Yeah. Everything is a job for a reason. Like it, everyone wants to be Miley Cyrus until they realize how Miley Cyrus destroyed herself. And now she's what, like in her 30s, and she seems like a 70-year-old woman because of all the shit she's been through at a young right. age. Like right. – everyone wants to be an actor until they realize that what it takes to be actually good and tap into those emotions. Dude, I look insane. That's what I'm saying. Your insanity thing is spot on. Do I look like a nut job walking around the neighborhood saying out my lines and speaking to myself and talking, creating these things and moving differently? People think I'm probably a fucking nut, but that's what gets me going. That's what makes me feel when I have a day of like, I can't get, when I can't first get a script, I hate it because I don't have any connections to the character. And I have to take the time and read it and try to dive into it. And then when I find days where I just can't make any connections or can't make any progress with it or can't connect to this person, I feel like shit. But when I find a day when I'm going and my juices are flowing and I'm freaking like, oh, my God, I understand this guy. It's so rewarding. And that's what that's what to me. You got to love the work just as much as you love that high, you know, oh, you absolutely, if you don't, that's why for most people, a nine to five is probably the way to go. Like if you can be anything, but an artist, be something, but an artist, because to, to, to go through that freaking hating yourself, like literally depressed to the point of thoughts, you don't even want to bring up just to get to that other side of this high that's unlike anything else, man, that's what life is about to me, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's funny you mentioned that because I was listening to a podcast with J. Cole recently and, you know, very, very successful artist, yeah. like, you know, one of the most successful of the last 10 years. And he was talking about like, the first thing he realized when he got really successful was that 
he didn't feel any better once he got successful that when the song blew up and you know, his management and his labels are all like, dude, we got a million streams in the first week. Oh, dude, we got this, you know, we sold this many records, whatever. He was like, that's cool. But he realized that nothing compared to that feeling of when he was actually creating, when he was actually in the studio, actually doing the thing, actually tapped into that magic, right? And so many of us were so focused on, and I, I mean, I have to tell this to myself all the time, we're so focused on, oh, I can't wait for this song to go viral. Oh, I can't wait to get play on the radio. Oh, I can't wait to be able to do this and this and this and that. But then if you're always trying to, to look forward to and find that thing in the future, you forget to enjoy the part right now. And there's a reason why you started doing this, right? There's a reason why you started the podcast. There's a reason why I decided to make music again. And, and enjoying that moment and being fully aware of what you're creating and the sort of special space you're being within that is the rewarding part and it gets really difficult but if you're not enjoying what you're doing right now if you're not having those moments of elation of connecting with a character or like with me right now i'm working on this this last verse in the song i'm trying to figure out how, how can i bring all this together if I don't sit back and appreciate and acknowledge when I lock in that final verse or when you finally, you know, become one with this character, then there's no reason to do it because it's not going to be that much more satisfying when you get to the other side. You know, this is the special part. This, this is the magic. I think being able to sustain yourself, being able to pay your bills and travel freely and buy the clothes you want to buy off of your craft is amazing but you have to love the process. You have to love the process. That's the reason, one of the reasons I, I don't just interview people for myself and I don't not post anything on social media and just be a hermit because I feel like I'm lucky that I found a passion at a young age. I feel like so many people can go their whole life without finding a passion and that's what yep. leads to depression. Yep. And I just want other people to see and to try all sorts of different shit until they find that thing that makes their heart flutter and go, I, I, this is what I want to live for. That's yes. what I want people. I want everyone to find. That's why people aren't interested in school because they're, they're not passionate about it until they yes. find that subject. They are. And they're like, Oh my God, I love it. So to anyone watching this, that's why I want you to listen to these. And that's why I want you to try all sorts of different things and to become a student because I want you to find your passion. I want you to be in love with what you're doing and I want you to love your life. So on that note, because my computer is also dying, I want to thank you, Sean, for coming on the podcast. Yes, I had a wonderful you, conversation. I learned so much. I want everyone that is watching this to subscribe because, I mean, these videos are heat. Like, what, what are you doing? Click the subscribe Computers. button. Yeah. Drop a comment down below if you have a guest you want to come on, you think I should interview? You think I should ask some questions? If you think my questions sucked, drop a comment down below. What should I have asked Sean? And on that note, class dismissed.